Okay. So, why don't we take a break right there, and um, and if anybody has any points to make or anything you want to discuss about what we what we talked about, uh, or any or any questions or details that you want to bring up. Okay. All right. Well, then let's skip on over to the word covenant on page twenty-two. <coughs> When we, when we do the Eucharist in, in this parish and any other Episcopal parish, we always, we always say these words um, during communion. This is the blood of the new covenant. And it, and it talks about the new covenant. Um, the, the, the Hebrew heritage of covenant is really important to our faith because it's about a covenant that was made between God and God's people. Uh, God made promises, I will be your God and you will be my people. Those were the promises that he made to Abraham and all of Abraham's progeny. So they lived that and that was their covenant. It came to be that that covenant included 613 specific laws that they had to abide by, which was very difficult, you might imagine, living by 613 <laughs> different laws about food and the way you faced when you worshipped, I mean, and all that kind of stuff. And that, that's the Hebrew faith, which we honor, but, but Christ said, this is a new covenant, all right? The, the new covenant is that you love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. These are the two and greatest commandments, he said. And so that's the new covenant, and that's the new covenant that, that Christ instituted um, on the last day before he went to the cross, saying, this is what I'm dying for. I'm dying so that you can be forgiven. And you can be forgiven by my sacrificing myself as a result of God's promises to you. So Christ becomes the new covenant. Right? So we, that's, how we, that's how we look at the Gospels. That's how we look at um, Christ's life and what Christ gave for us on the cross is that new covenant so that we... Because we know that we are flawed, we know we're going to screw up, and we're still forgiven, right? Even if we violate all 613 of those laws, you know, which we know we're going to do every single day of our lives, then we're still forgiven, right? And, um, and that's, why, that's why in our church we have confession every single Sunday. Now, we don't do it like the Catholic Church does it. We don't have to go and bear our souls individually to the priest because there is no mediator for our covenant. There is no mediator for our forgiveness. Each individual confesses in their soul to Christ, to God, and that's a pure confession without the need for a human intermediary. Um, which, is, which to me is one of the beautiful parts of our faith, that we do actually have a confession. Because there's a lot of Protestant religions, that Protestant denominations that don't even have a confession as part of their regular mm -hmm. liturgy. And so I think, I think the confession is an, an important part of our liturgy, but it's, it, there's, there's not, you don't come and sit down in front of me to make your confession. You know, I don't care what you've done to screw up this week, right? You're still coming to communion. And and I make my confession at the same time that you guys do. That's what's so beautiful about it. It's not, it's not you confessing to me. It's all of us as one unit, as one church, as one community confessing to God at one time. And that's good enough. You know, that's good enough in our church. And that's what's so, that's one of the things that's so beautiful to me about, about how we do that. Um, okay, so um, let's skip on over to reaffirming the baptismal covenant on page 24. Um, and this is, what this, this is what this class is all about, is, is preparing everyone at, who's going to be watching this and who's going to participate on January 12th with the bishop is everyone who is confirmed, received, or reaffirms their baptismal covenant 
is choosing to renew the covenant with God to confirm the baptismal promises and to seek God's strength to live into that covenant because the covenant itself when we say it together says all these things that we will do but every single covenant that we say we will do says we will do it with God's help because we know we can't do it without God's help that's what it's all about is that we seek God's help every time we kneel in prayer every time we put our head on our pillow at night every time we're driving our car and we have a thought about God that we want to express then it's always with God's help we always seek God's assistance in the things that we try to do and that's what reaffirming the baptismal covenant is about and so um, on page 25 in the middle where we renew the promises these are the promises that we renew do you believe in God the Father do you believe in Jesus Christ the Son of God and do you believe in God the Holy Spirit that's a reaffirmation of the Trinity the Trinity has been expressed in so many ways and there is no way in the world that I or, or anybody else can give a better description of what's already been given but it is something that is central to our faith that God God exists in God the Father whom I don't always call God the Father because I'm not sure God's a male but um, <laughs> And you know, some of our language that we use in our liturgy always expresses God as a male, and I sort of wish we could change some of that at times, um, because that came about, I think, historically, and and it sort of limits, to me, it sort of limits our expression of who God is. Uh, but that's not, I don't want to dictate that thought to any of you. I mean, that's our own expression of our own faith of who, who God is, how we perceive God. But the most important part is that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and, and the Word, as expressed by God in the beginning of time, is Christ. It came into our lives historically at a specific time. It taught us who God was, and told us when He ascended that He was sending the Spirit to be with us, right? And that's what we do now, is we call upon that Holy Spirit to be active within our lives in hopes that that someday all will be reconciled to God. That's what our faith is about, that we will all at some point be reconciled to God. And it seems like such an impossible thing sometimes. But, you know, we do believe, I think, we have to believe that all things are possible with God. And um, that's what prayer is about. And so when we envision the coming of the kingdom, it's, it's our job to make that kingdom present to the extent that we can here on earth in our own little walks, you know, through life. As meager as that may be, um, that at some point it is our hope and our dream that they will come to fruition in a way that we can't even imagine. It's, it's way beyond our ability to imagine. Um, so let's skip over to page 27. <clears throat> Down at the very bottom, uh, we were talking some more about here about the baptismal promises. Um, it says, you might wonder whether you can in all honesty say yes to each. And it says, don't worry. I love that. Don't worry. Questioning whether you can promise this faithfulness means you're taking these questions seriously and being honest with yourself. A large part of our faith is our doubt. Let me say that again. A large part of our faith is our doubt. Faith, faith is an ongoing journey. And if you were to tell me here tonight you've never doubted the existence or the goodness of God, I would say you're not being truthful with me. Uh, and so that's permissible, guys. It's okay. That's what life's about. And and, and we have to understand that we are only human and God gives us a mind and the mind that God gives us is one that is capable of doubt, right? If, if, it weren't, if we weren't capable of doubt and we chose to believe, that wouldn't be a very good choice, would it? That would be just like no the choice. No big deal. No big deal. It would be, this is what you do. This is mm -hmm. the way it is. 
It's not that way. God is the God of free will. God gives us the will to choose what we want to choose about the way that we believe. And, and that's part of our everyday expression of our own soul, you know, when we talk to God in prayer. And if you, tell, if you talk to God in prayer and say, God, what in the world are you doing to me? That's an expression of doubt. That's an expression of God not being present in your life. And that's not going to hurt God's feelings. Okay, It's not going to hurt God's feelings. He knows how to handle that. Um, you know, it's, it's, he's been handling it for thousands of years, and he can still do it. So I, I think that's an important part of our faith is the ability to say, John, when, when your lovely wife died, you were going, I'm sure you were going, God, where are you? What's, what's going on? Why are you doing this? Um, it's funny you said, not that much, but I've struggled and I still struggle to this day yeah. with, um, I, I, I guess, doubt. I was question, but for so many years, having been brought up Catholic, where it's like the, the blinders that put on a horse. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is all you can do. It's all you can do. It's all you can do. So I, just some things just... Not that it didn't make sense. I just could. I, I questioned whatever yeah. the words. I still to yeah. this day do sure. things. You know. Sure. It's but, normal. Uh, it is normal. I know. It's normal, and it's okay. That's the other thing. I mean, if you just stop to think about, is there a heaven? Yeah. Your head can spin. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. If you want to test if you've been drinking, if you're sober, <laughs> try to think about that. You'll know right away if you're sober. <laughs> I prefer to think about it over a margarita. Oh, it usually opens, <laughs> it opens my mind but, to all I sorts mean, of you know, better experiences. But, so, yeah. I mean, it would, and, I, and I don't want to use you guys as an example, but, but when you, you know, we buried John's mama the other day. It was a lovely service. It was a lovely time of gathering of the family and a reuniting of John and his family with this community. It was a beautiful thing to behold for me. And I'm so thankful that you enabled me to be a part of that. But that's what, that's what faith is about, is, is those moments when you can really, really, really feel God's presence, right? That, that compensates for those moments when you can't feel God's presence. Because the ones where you can, you know, that's like, man, you just feel it, you know. So it, God gives us those moments. Um, and sometimes they're taken away from us, right, for reasons that we don't know. Um, but it's not really for us to question why that is. It's for us to have faith and, and understand that God will be present in those moments that we need God uh, in whatever way that we need God. It's still easier said than done. It is. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. It's still easier, but that's what community is about. Yeah. My my belief is that that when we're isolated, we lose that. Mm -hmm. When we come into community together, we can regain it, and that's what's so important about having a community to su to support you. Bless her heart, little Lisa who died. I mean, Richard's dying, and and she knows it, and and she's struggling with it, but she comes here and she sings in the choir and she has her community hugs her and talks with her and, and she's you know she's working she's working through it so you know we'll get more later on on community and the importance of community in our church but this um, the important part here that's being covered now is is a definition of God and who God is in our life and and understanding that we can have a feeling of God's absence and still seek Oftentimes, seek God's presence <laughs> by just being in community and being with other people who believe the same way that we believe. Um, I've got a story I remember. It was, it was a woman outside of a Catholic hospital, and I guess it was either a loved one, or it may have been a father or a son, uh, who was who had passed or was passing, and she is screaming at a statue of the Virgin Mary, screaming, kicking it, throwing dirt at it. Now security is getting a little crazy because first the sacrilege of it, mm -hmm. and a nun came out because they went and read the nun, and the nun said, "Leave her alone. She's praying." Wow. I like that. Wow. I'm like, wow. Because wow. I too was raised. What with, an enlightened you're, person. You're never allowed to be mad at yeah. God. He can only be mad at you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's like, that's wow. right. Yeah. 
considered that way. Yeah. I'm wrathful, vengeful about it, right? Hello. 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 Hi. Come on down. Oh, you're down there? Yeah. 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 Well, this AA. Where's this other mic? Hi, hey, Christian. Come on in. How are you? Fine. How are you? The hot water heater broke over there. The hot water heater broke over there. Okay. So, do you need me? No. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Have fun. Enjoy. Thanks for taking care of it. <laughs> All right. A little bit. Now we'll deal with it. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so let's flip on over to page 33, and this is a little interlude between chapter chapter one and chapter two. Uh, on page 33, down about halfway down, it says, "I have a rubber stamp that says the Episcopal Church resisting simplistic theology since 1785." Does that sound like what's been going on in this room for the last 45 minutes? I think it is. It's you know we we resist the simplistic notion of defining God in a limited way uh, because God can't be defined in a limited way. God is, as my in my first week of seminary, Peter Carnley, the Archbishop of Australia said, God is that which, God is that which is grander than anyone can imagine. In other words, you can't imagine or even the, or in any way try to define what God is. We see God through Scripture. We see God's actions in the world through Scripture. We see God through Christ. We see God through our own personal experiences, but we all have different personal experiences. So how can any one of us define God in a certain way? We can't. And attempts to do so are really kind of frustrating. Um, we all define God in our own way. We define our relationship with God in a certain way. But defining God as whoever God is is beyond our capability. We just have to, we have to understand that. We may see God in an entirely different way 10 years from now than we saw God 20 years ago. Uh, you know, I hope we do. I hope we grow in our understanding of God as, as we work through our lives. So now we're going to talk just a little bit, beginning on page 36, about the Bible. Um, we've got about 10, 15 minutes left, so uh, we ought to talk about the Bible. <laughs> and, and so we go to page 36 uh, and it's important for you guys to kind of know a little bit of the history of the Bible um, the Bible really the earliest writings in the Bible in the Old Testament occurred around 1000 BC or perhaps 900 BC and those were the earliest writings of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus Numbers and Deuteronomy which are, which are the first five books you know, of the Bible called the Torah uh, in the Hebrew Bible and then we have all the prophets that were written sometime between 800 and 500 uh, BC during the time that Israel was was a nation and discovering itself as a nation and discovering itself as a community in relationship with God and the way they saw God there were many many struggles during that time about how they saw God that's what the prophets talked about when, when you read Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Amos, Hosea, and all those, you'll see all sorts of different views of God, who they thought God was, and how they related to God. And we read those in our lectionary, and, and so I don't need to define all that for you right now, but as you read the Bible, think about that time, the Hebrew people, and how they were forming their relationship with God as a community that saw itself as being chosen by God, and how God acted in the world, and that's what those stories are all about. Um, and then um, we, when we get, well, it's also important to know that the when the people, when the Hebrew people left slavery in Egypt and found their way through the desert and to reclaim their homeland in Israel. Um, that was somewhere around 1200, okay? Between 1100 and 1200 BC. They formed a nation, they decided they needed to have kings, and they started having kings. Then the having prophets, what? I didn't hear you. They started having kings. Kings. Okay. Having kings, first king being Samuel, and then David, and then Solomon. And, um, and they decided they needed a temple, so they built a temple as a place to worship. 
because before that all they had was the Ark of the Covenant, which was wandering, you know, around the desert, and they wanted a home for worship, so they built the temple during the time of of David and Solomon, which is their central place of worship. That temple was destroyed in 597 BC, and all the Israelites were captured by people of Babylon and taken to Babylon. They lost their homeland, they lost their worship place, and they were lamenting that for the next hundreds of years until they rebuilt the temple uh, in around 200 or so BC. That temple stood until Jesus' time, and um, the temple was then again destroyed. The second temple was destroyed in around 70 to 75 AD. Jesus predicted the destruction of the temple because he said that followers of God weren't doing the way, doing things and living the way they should live and they weren't following Christ's teachings. And so the second temple was then destroyed and then they didn't have a, a temple, you know, for uh, another hundreds, hundreds of years. That was during the time that Christianity began to be formed after um, around 70 to 80 uh, AD, which is when most, which was in the four gospels were written about that time between 70 and 90 AD. Um, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were written during that time. Um, the letters of Paul were sent to the various churches that he established around the Mediterranean between 50 and 65 AD. So the letters of Paul were all written before the Gospels were written. The stories that are, that are given in the Gospels were actual stories of Christ, which was around 30 to 33 AD. But the writers of the Gospel didn't write about Christ's journeys and travels until sometime between 70 and, and 90. We have all sorts of historical documents that show that, that bear that out on papyrus and other things that were discovered in the Dead Sea Scrolls and all that. So we learn from all those things about where the books of the Bible came. The, um, the Old Testament was not actually put together as a, a composite until about 100 AD. Um, and it was put together in response to the fact that Christianity was seen as a threat to the Jewish people. And so the Hebrews decided that they needed to actually consolidate the Old Testament into one place, and they did. And so that's how we got all the books of the 39 books of the Old Testament put together in, in one place, and then Christianity decided, well, we needed to kind of collect our stuff together. So they began to talk about how we were going to put together the writings that would, that would become what we now have as the New Testament. And that happened between about 120 and 200 AD. And there was all sorts of argument in the church about which books should be included. There were some, there was this guy named Marcion who was kind of a jerk. And um, he said, no, we don't, we don't like the God of the Old Testament. We don't want to include the Old Testament within our stuff. Uh, and, and then there was another guy that, uh, named Origen who was a little more enlightened. And he said, no, our faith is comprised not only of the documents from Christianity, but also the documents from Old Testament times that we ought to include it all. Well, Origen won. Okay, and so, and so we had beginning to assemble the New Testament, which became part of what, you know, what we call uh, our, our Bible at that time in, in the late 200, early 300 time period. And it wasn't until 312 that Christianity became the declared prominent faith of that part of the world, which was comprised of the Roman Empire, right? And that happened when Constantine, when the Emperor Constantine took power and, and declared that Christianity was gonna be the religion of that part of the world in the Roman Empire. And Constantine decided that we should have a creed that would be established to set forth our beliefs of Christianity, which is when we got the Nicene Creed, which was done in 326, when Constantine called uh, a huge uh, 
uh, conglomeration of leaders of the church together and said, this is what we believe. We need to believe uniformly. And that became the creed of the church. Now, at that time, it was just one church. It was the one holy Catholic apostolic church. Right? And it remained that way until the 1500s when we had the Protestant Reformation um, and uh, Martin Luther you know, became prominent and started saying this is not the right way to do things. Uh, and, and there began to be other denominations that, that spun off from that originally Lutheran and Dutch Reformed and some Scandinavian religions, congregational and all sorts of stuff. The Anglican Church, and this is where we're gonna stop for tonight, the Anglican Church was a spinoff from Catholicism but it didn't spin off from Catholicism as far as the other Reformed churches did because there was all sorts of political things going on in, in the European world and the British Empire at that time. And there were things happening in <coughs> England with respect to battles between the families who were kings and queens. And so what, what happened was the, Episcop the Anglican Church followed what we call the via media, which is the middle way between Protestantism and Catholicism, and decided on Anglicanism, which was going to be the way that, and that, that whole process took about 100 years to get settled to the point where Anglican became the official Church of England, and still is the official Church of England. We as Episcopalians started when after the uh, revolution, um, the, the people who were Anglicans in this country didn't want to call ourselves Anglicans because we were separate and independent from them. So we formed the Episcopal Church right about the same time as the Constitution in 1789. And we didn't want to call ourselves Anglicans, so we called ourselves Episcopalians. England didn't recognize us. So we had to actually have our first bishop consecrated in Scotland rather than England, and that was the beginning of the Episcopal Church of the United States, which we're a part of. The new English bishops came around, right? Finally, yeah, finally they did. But you know, they still, the Anglican Church is still um, not always in the same vein as we are theologically about a lot of different things, and that's that can change. You know, still exist. There is what's called the Anglican Communion all over the world that the Episcopal Church is part of, but there are some things about which we differ theologically from other places in the world, and we'll get into that more, more deeply as we go through the next uh, five weeks. But I wanted to get to that point so we could talk about the beginning of the Episcopal Church in the United States, because that's where we're going to head uh, next time. Cool. Cool. Very cool. I think we need a field trip to uh, <laughs> England. No, I don't know. I'm thinking Israel. I'm thinking, oh, I'm thinking Israel. I have been there. Oh, that would be fun. I've not. I have not been there. I'd love to go. I'd love to go on sabbatical sometime. It's amazing. Just tromp around Israel. It's really amazing. Yeah. So, any any questions or comments you guys have about what we? I, I know we. I, this last part was real fast, but I wanted to get us up to where okay. we needed to be to start next week, but. Um, any questions you guys have, say them now or think about them, and we'll you know we'll talk about them next time. Um, and if you have questions or comments you want to make, you know, privately to me, uh, just you know email me and we'll you know we'll talk because I I want this to be not only a learning experience but also an experience about which you can express your own thoughts and feelings and your own perceptions of what you know what we're talking about because that's that's important. Okay. What are we reading for next week? Uh, we'll, we'll read uh, the next section of pages, I think about another 40 or 50, and uh, Janet's already uh, scanned those and got them ready to send out to everyone. Okay. Oh, good. So good. she'll send those out, with, send them out to the whole parish, and, um, and you know, especially to the people who are part of the group that's going to be confirmed. But I'm, I'm, it's really good to have people who are not actually here just because they have to be. That's nice. <laughs> <laughs> and I appreciate it. So why don't we close in prayer?
Most gracious God, we thank you for the beauty of this community. We thank you for the love that you've given us, and the love that we all show to each other. We thank you for giving us minds and hearts to perceive who you are, to who Christ is, and how we look at each other as your face, and how we express ourselves to others around us. We thank you for the spirit that you put within us. Please give us open minds, open hearts to do your will, to understand your will, and to express your will to the world around us. We ask all this in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, guys. That was so nice. Great, great to have you here for this. Since I was touching, I have to say again, very fun. I really have enjoyed it. Thank you. 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 Thank you.